Jack Dorsey says hyperinflation, and Kathy Wood says deflation. You decide. This is Andrew Stotts of A. Stotts Investment Research. Let's get started. What can we learn from 120 years of inflation? Let's start by looking at World War I, which was a defining moment for inflation. Here is a chart of inflation over the 120 years, and you can see I've highlighted the progressive era. World War I was from 1914 to 1918. The U.S. entered in mid-1918. There was 22 million combatant and civilian deaths out of a population across the world of 1.8 billion. There was 17 to 100 million deaths after the war due to genocides and the 1918 Spanish flu hmm, pandemic. We're having a little taste of that right now. And then demand pull inflation peaked at 20% in 1918. This is our first time that we can see how war is a defining factor for inflation. So is inflation going to go up like Jack Dorsey thinks or down like Kathy Wood thinks? Well, you decide after watching this. Let's move into the Roaring Twenties, which led to the Great Depression. Here we can see I've highlighted the period of 1919 to 1932, what I call post-World War I, Roaring Twenties, and Great Depression hangover. The Roaring Twenties saw e rapid economic expansion and a stock market bubble. Tw 1929 stock market crash brought the end to the post-war bubble and led to a depression, in fact, the Great Depression. Inflation bottomed at 10.8%. Now, you can't see the 10.8 on this chart because this, ladies and gentlemen, is a five-year moving average. I've smoothed it out a little bit. Now, next, FDR brought America's hope from desperation, and Stalin, Mao, and Hitler were on the rise. We move into the period of 1933 to 1939, and the Great Depression recovery sets the groundwork for another war, World War II. By that time, Nuremberg laws had removed German citizenship from Jews. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a landslide election for his second term, and Joseph Stalin had his great purge, and the Communist Party of China completed the Long March, led by Mao Zedong. So, the, um, the, the awful World War II. This is such an amazing picture of what these young people faced. From 1940 to 1946, the world erupted into war again. Only two decades after World War I, another world war started. It was from 1939 until 1945. There was 80 million fatalities, the majority of being civilians. And inflation peaked at in 1946 at 18%. Again, this is a moving average, so you don't see that 18%, which would be about right there. Next, on the 22nd of July, 1944, Bretton Woods Agreement happened at Mount Washington Hotel. It set the rules for commercial and financial relations with the US, Canada, Western European countries, Australia, and Japan. Each country agreed to fix its currency to gold to maintain, maintain currency stability. Then there was the Potsdam Declaration, which called for the surrender of all Japanese armed forces. And on July 26, 1945, the U.S. outlined the terms of surrender for the Empire of Japan. The ultimatum stated that if Japan did not surrender, it would face prompt and utter destruction. On August 6, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and the 9th of August, another one on Nagasaki. A horrific moment for humankind. Japan announced its intention to surrender on the 15th of August and then signed the surrender document on the 2nd of September, 1945. World War II was over. As one of my favorite teachers, who I actually studied with when I was a young man of age 24, America was great because every other country was destroyed. Dr. W. Edward Deming said, in the decade after the war, the rest of the world was devastated. North America was the only source of manufactured products that the rest of the world needed. Almost any system of management will do well in a seller's market like that. So America was the manufacturing operation of the whole world. And eventually we went into the 1947 and 1964 period, the US-led post-World War II recovery. From this period, 1947 to 1961, the US, was, US war production shifted to the private sector. 
And that started to stabilize the economy and market forces started balancing out supply and demand. That reduced inflation during that period. And then the Vietnam War ramped up. Again, we see war with inflation and death. From 1965 to 1970 was this period and the Vietnam War reignited inflation. War production reignited this demand pull inflation. More than 2 million Vietnamese dead and 58,000 Americans dead. Another tragedy. Now, on the 15th of August, 1971, President Nixon ended convertibility of the U.S. dollar to gold, and that ended the Bretton Woods system, kicking off the dollar as a fiat currency. A new era of floating currencies across the world uh, start, went into free floating. And the thing here is that people say that the U.S. has never defaulted on its debt. Well, here they clearly defaulted because countries were sending ships to collect the gold that they were supposed to get from the U.S. in exchange for their dollars and they couldn't get that gold anymore. So, next, the Middle East became the war focus of the U.S. for the next 40 years. It's really a tragedy of my lifetime that the U.S. has just been involved in the Middle East so much. So we can look at this period of time where we can see oil shock brought inflation to 12.3% in 1974. Again, this is a five-year moving average, so it's not going to be showing that 12% in 1974. It's going to be showing yeah, that would normally be whoop, about right there. And from late 1973 to early 1974, oil price had risen 300%. It was caused by an oil embargo against countries that supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Next, the oil crisis brought inflation to 13.3% in 1979. It was caused by a drop in oil production after the Iranian Revolution that happened in 1979. For old folks like me, we remember that time when the hostages from America were held. Global supply fell only 4%, but oil price went up twice, two times in a year. This is a good omen. I mean, this tells you a little bit about what could happen to oil prices going forward. And it sparked the 1980 to 1988 Iran-Iraq war. Next thing that happened is Paul Volk Volcker breaks the back of inflation. Jimmy Carter appointed Volcker and Ronald Reagan, the guy in the middle, reappoint him for a second term. Oil price was $128 per barrel in mid-1990, but it fell to $18 to, per barrel at the end of 1998. It was nearly a 20-year oil price decline. This is part of a 40-year deflationary cycle, oil price caught falling over 20 years. And so I've marked that on this chart now. We can see breaking the back of inflation, and we can see that the oil price fell. So what came next in this deflationary period? Globalization brought hundreds of millions of low-income workers to the global job market, particularly China. U.S. wages measured in gold peaked in 2000, falling since. China has been on the rise. This chart shows the typical American worker could buy 51 ounces of gold with their wages in 1990, but only 30 ounces by 2020. Typical Chinese worker could only buy one ounce of gold in 1990 with their wages and now can buy about nine ounces. If you want to think about why Trump got elected, part of this has to do with it. It was just a destruction of the core of America right there. Not just black, Hispanic, and other marginalized, but even the white population was struggling during this time as wages collapsed. I moved out of Ohio in 19... Uh, 89 or so, and by that time, jobs were already leaving Ohio and heading to Asia. I moved to Asia in 1992, and it was booming, so I could see what was happening on this side of the world. Now, 1990 to 2000 was when globalization would bring labor costs, low-cost labor, and that's depressing wages. So I'm trying to say that we had a 40-year down cycle. Also, this is 40 years of disturbance that the U.S. has been involved in in the Middle East, which I hate to see that disturbance. And I think we should leave countries at peace. But you can see falling oil price and the falling wages are major factors. And then the Fed tries to save the world. In 2008 to the present, the Fed repeatedly releases an unprecedented torrent of QE cash. And you can see on this chart, I show QE1 that happened in 2008. And I so QE infinity, which started in 2020. You may say, Andrew, why do you say QE infinity? Because the Fed can never turn it off. That's what I think. Now, one last thing to consider is the relationship between inflation and the money supply. 
Generally, we represent the money supply as M2. Let's look at a chart here I pulled from longtermtrends.net. You can see a relatively strong positive relationship between inflation and money supply over the period of time of about 120 years. Number one, let's look at the Great Depression. You can see money supply contraction, and we saw deflation. Then in, uh, tw uh, in the second period was World War II, and we can see that money printing was massive. Inflation rose. Then we can see Nixon float the U.S. dollar. It ends Brenton Woods, and we see that inflation is rising. And then Volcker reduces the money supply, and as a result, inflation started to fall, and that began a 40-year fall in inflation. Now, over the long term, money supply and inflation moved together. I decided to make this chart just to show that, but so I'm, I'm just going to circle that this is a five-year moving average. And what you can see is a pretty close relationship that uh, here, and what you can see, the big gap here, is that we've had this huge amount of rise, of course, in the money supply and a very tiny move in inflation. So there's about a 53% correlation of these two lines when you look at their five-year moving average. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you, hyperinflation, like Jack Dorsey says, or deflation, like Kathy Wood says? You decide.